One of the first ICs, or integrated circuits, you'll probably come across as a budding electrical engineer is this little guy. It's a 555 timer. Again, we aren't positive why it's called that. It might be because the initial design had five kilo-ohm resistors in there, three of them, 555. Or the person that invented it might have just really liked the number five. Doesn't matter, does some pretty neat things. There are three ways you can set it up. There is monostable operation, where when you trigger the input high, no matter how briefly, it outputs a pulse of a set duration. So if you're using a push button, you can set the input high for a second, and then it'll generate, say, a 10 second pulse. You can set the length of that pulse based on the R and C, resistor and component values you set up around it. That's great if you're doing something like a light, where you push a button once and the light stays on for 10 seconds. The other mode is bistable operation. It's pretty similar to monostable, but it involves no capacitor setting the input and just two switches. So you have one connected to the input trigger and one connected to reset. So if you plug that output into a flip-flop, you can push one button, a pulse will happen in the positive direction, you push the other button and it'll get set back to zero. So you could use this in motor control. If you were going to put it right in the middle as base, you could say push one button, it'll spin one direction, push the other button, it'll reverse and start spinning the other direction, send an input high and low, etc. The most useful one, in my opinion, and we're going to be talking about today, is called A-stable operation. It involves nothing from the user. There's no input trigger here. What happens is based on how you set up two resistors and one capacitor, it will start creating a rectangular wave, or square wave if you do the numbers right, without any user operation. So you don't need to do anything, there's no input, it just starts generating a wave for you. You can see how this would be useful, sending timing downstream to another circuit, using it to turn on and off an LED like we'll do, etc. You get a nice wave without having to do anything to it. This is the 8-pin package, there's also a 14-pin package. They all pretty much operate the same way. Something you'll have to be very careful about when you look at the data sheet is that typically when they set up the circuit for you, the recommended use of circuit, it is not in order one, two, three, four, up through eight pins like these are labeled here. So just be careful when you're looking at the data sheet and make sure you set it up right based on how the pinout actually happens in the chip. Based on the data sheet, I've created this monstrosity. So what's happening here? Pin one is facing me. It has a little divot on the top. That's how you can tell where pin one is going to be. This pin app has pins one through four, five through eight. Pin one is ground, pin eight is power. I've got a couple other things connected up to power, again, as shown in that data sheet. I've got a 10 microfarad capacitor and two resistors. I have a 10K resistor and a 220 kilo ohm resistor. That will set both the duty cycle and period of the LED blinking down here because I've got that blinking LED hooked up to the output pin. So like we were talking about, this does not require any user interface. So I'm just gonna power it up. I have this set to six volts because this particular chip can take anywhere from five up to 12. Nice safe region. So when I turn it on, you see that LED start blinking. So because of the capacitors that I've chosen, or capacitors and resistors, the duty cycle is pretty high. You can see that it's on a lot more than it's off and that it's blinking pretty quickly. So if I were to switch those two resistors, you get a different operation. Now, it's not completely linear. It's not like switching those two completely switches the duty cycle. What happens is based on how the time constant of one of the resistors and the capacitors you've chosen works, it will create a situation where the capacitor charges up to about two thirds of the voltage at that voltage divider between R1 and R2, and then it'll start discharging because the trigger will have triggered and the other half of the duty cycle will be happening. So that's kind of what's going on. That's how you set up a simple blinking LED in a horrible rat nest. Guys, this is never what we turn in, right? This is what we turn in. <laughs> So I have the original resistor set up in there. You can see what happened here, right? I've got resistors that still have their leads long. I've got the capacitor there. I used all the same long wires. 
it's a disaster. Even though this works, nobody likes to see this. This will get you full points. Make sure this is what you do. These are the short little breadboard wires that are set up at certain lengths based on the 0.1 inch spacing of a breadboard. So they will all fit exactly. Don't try to force anything. You can see that on these resistors, I've trimmed down the lead so they go flush against the board. And now if I apply power and ground, you can actually see what is going on in there. And it's interesting, even though I have the exact same resistor, capacitor, setup, everything as this one, it's actually a little bit brighter on this board just because I lost the resistance of all of these wires. So it pays to be neat, and any professor or TA would be so much happier to see this it works exactly the same. And that is how you use a 555 timer.